Great, so our next speaker for the afternoon will be Pierrick Mousseau, telling us about higher genus wall crossing and quantization. Thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. So in some sense, this talk is a natural continuation of the previous talk, because at least morally, the topic will be higher genus open curves. And, but we will somehow mix this story with some mirror symmetry. So I just start by recalling the very basic principle of X, Y, Z mirror symmetry, where on the one side you have some Lagrangian fabrication. And you are supposed to take the dual fabrication. And obviously, this thing is supposed to work outside single of fibers. And so the main difficulty comes from single of fibers. Which are responsible for so called instant corrections. Which geometrically has to do with holomorphic disks. With boundary on the torus side. Okay, so maybe the simplest just cartoon is with a very simple idea that if you have some singular fiber that some of the singular fiber will produce holomorphic disk. Which can have boundary on the torus fibers. And so part of the geometry of symmetry story is that some of you need to take into account these enumerative stories, these holomorphic disks, if you want to get the correct mirror. And so the basic question that we'll ask is, <coughs> What about iogenous versions of these objects? <coughs> so let's say, what about about iogenous holomorphic curves with boundaries? <coughs> on the torus fibers of the exquisite fabrication. So this question is a bit unprecise. So you know, using holomorphic disk, you're supposed to produce a mirror. And here, uh, I'm asking, what are you supposed to do if you try to consider iogenous curves? And so we'll discuss this question in a very specific context. So first, for dimension reasons, you expect to have a lot of iogenous holomorphic curves here in dimension 3. So we stick to dimension 3. And we're not really being dimension three, but rather in dimension two plus one, which means that we consider some, essentially some Calabria threefold, which should be of the form Calabria twofold. That I will call U. So particular in dimension two, Calabio and holomorphic symplectic are the same, but this thing is some holomorphic symplectic surface. Cross a kind of trivial third direction, let's say I can take cross C star. And so you assume that this U has some kind of ordinary XYZ operation, and so so, so here we will ask some kind of torus fabrication here. And if you apply mirror symmetry, you should get the mirror. The mirror that I call U check, which will be another holomorphic <laughs> symplectic surface. Okay, so this is torus fabrication, so I can take a T2 fiber. And in this dimension three geometry, we consider a three-dimensional Lagrangian, 
given by the product of this T2, by the fiber of the XYZ fabrication of U, times the trivial third direction, let's say, cross R inside this star, and I will call this thing L. Okay, so if I take this three dimensional geometry, which is like Lagrangian L, we are in a kind of setting of the previous talk, and you can ask about counting open curves with boundary on L. And sometimes this talk will be it's much simpler than the previous talk because essentially you consider this, this is L with some kind of trivial rank one local system, so it's essentially about you watch and some of theory. So the, the so the so the general expectation so the expectation described in the previous talk is the relation between the higher genus open curves and chan sum of theory tell you that this story so higher genus curves with boundary on L should be in some sense related to U1 and some of theory on L. And so whatever it is, it's supposed to be a three-dimensional quantum field theory with space of classical solutions are flat U1 connections. And because L has this particular product form, a surface cross a line, you can somehow adopt a kind of Hamiltonian point of view on chance sum of theory where you think that this thing has been time. And so in this case, so whatever the classical phase space. of chan sum on theory is simply the set of U1 flat connections on T2. Which is simply the dual T2. So it is in this sense that the usual SYZ dual torus story is somehow compatible with the kind of classical version of chan sum of theory. But so what we really care about is the quantum version, the higher genus here is supposed to correspond to the quantum here, and so now you, you quantize the classical phase space, so quantize. And we should replace this, this dual T2, to replace this torus by the quantum torus. So later, I will be more precise about what I really mean, but roughly, this thing should be a kind of non-commutative algebra, which is a deformation of the algebra of functions on the teacher. Okay, and just remark, it's compatible with the previous talk. I think you should take, if you take L, I mean, more generally, if you take L, you go to form a surface cross R, or the sky module as a natural algebra structure, because we can, if you have some link and some, and some R position and you have two such a thing, you can concatenate them. And this is kind of the sky module of L as an algebra <coughs> structure. And if you do some of the specialization which corresponds to taking U1 rather than general UN, you get exactly the quantum torus. And then if you take U1, specialization. Okay, so the conclusion of this discussion is that you expect this count of hydrogenous curves to be related to the quantum torus. And the way you get your mirror, so the way you get your ordinary mirror to check is essentially by gluing tori plus corrections from all of this. This thing is a kind of classical picture, and now we'll have quantum picture, which will be doing quantum tori.
stress corrections from iogenous curves. Now we produce some non some non cumulative object, which will be a deformation quantization of our original mirror. So we produce deformation. <coughs> Which makes sense because you check the dimension two and it's holomorphic symplectic, and so it makes sense because it's deformation quantization. So I should say that this idea of in dimension two to deform this gluing of tori and into a story of gluing of quantum tori to produce deformation quantization is already at the end of Conseil Silverman paper on K3 surface, and there is a further paper on Silverman about this story. So, which I guess is maybe not well known, is this connection between these gluing of quantum story story is the enumerative geometry of iogenous curves. And to see it, you have to go to the three and, and to define these numbers, in some sense, you should think about this three-dimensional geometry. So, so maybe it's a good point to say that, in fact, in this talk, everything I will really do and prove is inside algebraic geometry, which means what I will really consider are not true open curves, but I, I will use logarithmic chromophyta invariants as algebraic approximations of count of iogenous open curves. But you should, and these numbers will be defined really in terms of curves going into the surface U. But to get the right numbers and the correct obstructions here, you should really think of this U as being a three dimensional geometry. So later I'll give a precise definition of the numbers I want. But to find this definition, you should really think about three-dimensional geometry. I mean, simply just for virtual dimension reasons, if you try to count higher gas curve in a surface, you don't find something of dimension zero. But if you think in a three-dimensional way, you find what is the correct what obstruction theory, which will give you the right numbers. So that right, if you just start with this picture in dimension two, I mean, somehow to find this, this connection, you need to think about the thing of dimension two to be related to something of dimension three, which is maybe not completely obvious a priori why it's a good thing to, to do. Okay, so the main goal of this talk is somehow to make to make this story precise in some, in some uh, context. Okay, so we want, so I define the geometry that we'll consider. So I want to, de to define the U that I will consider. So U will be a complex surface, and we expect this U to have some kind of XYZ torus vibrations. So we can start with a kind of Okay, so, so the, the way I will set up the data, I will fix some m, which will denote a collection m1 to mn, where each mi is some vector in z squared, and it's a primitive vector. So not multiple of another non zero vector. And then I will consider the fan given by the rays. Let's say minus the ray generated by M. Okay, so I get in R2, I get a picture with several rays. And I allow different MI to be collinear, so to define the same ray in this picture. And so maybe to be clear, I just wrote here some kind of cross, and the number of crosses is like the numbers of MI defining this ray. Okay, so, so I have this fan, and I consider simply why I'm the toric surface with this fan. Okay, so I draw a picture where I have toric divisors like that. So obviously, what is in the middle is simply star squared with a kind of obvious trivial torus vibration. 
And so what you want is to modify this picture to introduce singularities in such vectorial distributions to get something interesting. And so a standard way to do that is to consider the surface Y M bar, which is a blow up of Y M, where for each M I, I blow up a point on the divisor due to the ray generated by MI. Okay, so, so here I have one MI corresponding to this ray, so I blow, blow up one point here. Here I have two MI on this ray, so I blow up two points, that's two distinct points. The position of the points doesn't matter. So here I blow up one point, here I blow up three points, and here I blow up one point. Okay, so now this surface is, is no longer toric, because these blow ups are, are not toric blow ups. And what I will denote U, and more precisely it will be UM associated to this data M, will be the complement of, so it, it is the surface, minus the strict transform of the toric boundary. In other words, you aim a remove I remove this divisor. And you can check that this divisor is anti-canonical. And so this UM is indeed some non-compact homomorphic symplectic surface. Again, for exposition, I will draw pictures of toric vibrations and open curves. Even in, in reality, I've never used this picture, but to understand what's going on, it's helpful to have that in mind. So what's really going on here is that we start with this thing, which is toric vibration, which is a single fiber, and somehow blowing up a point essentially corresponding to seeing one single fiber into the picture. Where so this thing is just basic focus focus singularity in dimension two. You know that this thing would emit essentially two holomorphic disks in the one direction or the other. And somehow what happens in one direction, so the direction near the boundary, this holomorphic curve here, is simply the exceptional divisor here. And and on the other direction it will emit some other stuff. Okay, so 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 because we have blown up many points, in general we have many such in our fibers, which will emit many holomorphic curves. And the kind of natural question is how these holomorphic curves interact in the middle. And the kind of G0 version of this story, in some sense, is some, is some, some more classical story, but what the story I really care about is what happens when I allow to form a genus. <coughs> and then let me fix some notations to explain what I am really counting. I will fix P. Collection of non negative integers. So the same number as the number of MI. And then if I have this collection of, of integers, I can take the sum over I, let's say of J, DJ, MJ, which is simply some element in Z squared, because the MJ is a vector in Z squared. And so I can write it as. Some primitive vector in the square multiplied by some positive integer. And then the claim is just easy, like essentially homology telling you that there exists a unique homology class in the geometry that I'm considering such that the intersection 
of this homology class with the exception divisor EI, so let me call it EI. The exceptional divisor corresponding to the point that I've blown up corresponding to the vector MI is equal to PI. And so that Yeah, let me write it like that. Okay, so essentially we are looking to homogeneous classes which are obtained essentially by taking PI version of the curve going here for every I. And you take the class given by combining all these curves. Okay, so I drew the same picture as before. So essentially, here we start with some of the class, like essentially P, whatever P1 times this class, whatever P2 times this class, and the thing will combine and form more pure stuff. So now I need to tell you about what I'm really doing. Okay, so before I was talking about things with boundary on the Lagrangian torus fiber. So you could imagine I have some Lagrangian torus fiber here. But obviously, this count of curve in general will not be well defined, and it will depend on where my Lagrangian is. So what I'm really doing will be to study a limit where my Lagrangian torus fiber is really near infinity in this geometry, really near to the boundary divisor. Okay, so, so in this picture I'm about infinity of my divisors, the torus vibration is the complement, I will look to curves. is that you look to open curves with boundary and the Lagrangian really close to the boundary. And if it's close enough to the boundary, you should be able to close this curve into a closed curve, which now will touch, will touch the, the divisor at infinity. And so if you follow this homogeneous correlation, essentially this, this homogeneous correlation will tell you what would be the pattern of intersection of the curve of this given homogeneous class with the boundary divisor? Essentially, if it's vector MP, so this is MP, this MP is in the square, so it is a point in this picture, it is that square, some integral point, and if this MP is inside some quadrant, it means, so each ray it corresponds to some divisor, so quadrant corresponds to one intersection point of two divisor. The fact that MP is inside this quadrant means that my curve goes inside this, this point of intersection here, essentially with a kind of prescribed speed, where the prescribed speed is this LP times MP. And geometrically, this LP times MP is simply the, essentially the class, class, homogeneous class of the curves with boundary of the torus, which is somehow shrink in this limit. And, and so some of the point is that logarithmic Ramaphujan theory as developed by Abramovich, Drop, Chen, Gross, and Siebert gives a way to make sense of these count of curves. So it makes sense of these non trivial tangency condition here and give us a nice moduli space for such a curves. Okay, so give us some moduli space that I will call M bar GP. So yeah, the easiest way to phrase it is to stay at the surface level. And I really consider, so essentially, this closed log stable map to the geometry and look the module space of such a thing in terms G. And this thing has some virtual fundamental class. <coughs> so, so the reason you need the log theory and not just the relative theory is to go into the square? Yes. Y yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a usual way to theory if you have a smooth divisor. I see. And, yes.
Okay, so, so, from, so if I define this modulus space from the surface point of view, I mean, I really look to just stable log map to the surface, and I look to the corresponding virtual fundamental class, the virtual immersion you can check will be G. So in the surface, the virtual dimension grows with the genus. But because of what I said at the beginning, that you should really think to a three-dimensional geometry, you should really think to something like, uh, I guess, yeah, this thing may be across the star. In fact, you should really think that there's a kind of trivial third direction. So in other words, if I have a curve in the surface, you should really think to, to, to a kind of trivial third direction. So another one, I would like a kind of trivial, so you know, my curve relatively C star would have a kind of trivial normal bundle. And so I can modify the obstruction theory by taking a tie on the normal bundle, which, so the difference in obstruction theory would be H1, the normal bundle, which is trivial, so it is simply C vector space, which simply what I have a cell duality, is a dual of one form on the curve. And so if my curve has genus G, this thing is a wrong G vector bundle. So the right things to do to extract a number is to take this as a surface dimension G virtual fundamental class and to integrate over it the top channel class of this vector model. So when I wrote like that, I mean the wrong G vector model over the modulus space of curve, which is five over C is the wrong G vector space. Okay, so this thing is a well-defined rational number. <laughs> so, yeah, so what we really care about are these algebraically defined numbers, but you should really think of them as a kind of algebraic definition of some kind of higher genus, genus G, open curve, boundary on C like on a choice fiber, when C like on a choice fiber is very really close to infinity. So is it, it, it your opinion that matter is close to infinity <coughs> in which quarter or so, so I claim that where it goes is like to just determine by the homology. That you, yeah. So you know you should really think to this picture where some of the PI, which will ultimately describe the homology class of the curve, some of the others, like how many copies of the kind of elementary holomorphic disk I take, and then some of the combine, and where the thing goes, some of it's determined by that. Like, you know, because I mean, this thing like some prescribe the homology class of the one cycle on the torus, on the y cycle, so at the end you know the homology class on the one cycle, and if the thing is supposed to close, you're supposed to go in the direction where the one cycle shrink at infinity, and this thing is one direction one particular direction. Okay. So the main goal is to say something not sure about this collection of numbers. And the claim is that these numbers will have something to do with the quantum torus, which is an expectation. And so to make that precise, I need to talk about scattering diagrams. But maybe not the most familiar scattering diagrams used in mirror symmetry, which usually has a one volume and continuum zero counts. But I will use scattering diagram valued in automorphism of the quantum torus, which are maybe familiar from people doing Donaldson and Thomas theory, but which in our context is the correct objects to describe these higher chance counts. So let me use the notation M for my identity Z squared. And so the quantum torus. is simply some the algebra with the basis of monomials. C to the M for each M is a squared and with a product defined by Z to the M times Z to the M prime is equal to Q to the one half that's a determinant of mm prime z to the m plus m prime. Where q is some, let's say q to the one half is a formal algebra. It's the same q to the one half as in the previous talk. So let's say algebra over, what is that? 
this obviously is q to the y, simply an algebra of functions on some algebraic torus. And when q is not one, it gives a deformation quantization of that. <laughs> And that maybe let me go to the quantum torus and say A so Q. So now definition. So a scattering diagram. So in this talk it will be in R2 and valued in quantum torus. So it is a collection of rays. In R2, so here is one ray, and so for us the ray will be oriented and will have rational slope. So for every ray rho, I can consider its primitive integral direction because it's oriented. It will have m rho in z square, primitive direction. <coughs> of the ray row, but a collection of rays equipped with essentially equipped with function valued in the quantum torus. So equipped with so for each ray row I have something I would call a H row, which is an element in okay, so it's a scattering diagram over over some Complete local ring ring R. So you think to R is a ring of coefficients, which in our story would be essentially the homogeneous classes of curves. And so we want these things to believe in essentially the quantum torus tensored by this ring of coefficients. And maybe for the thing. Yeah, so I need to be more precise because there is some extra condition. It's not any element. It's not any element in the quantum torus, but for a ray rho, I want elements of the quantum torus which are monomial of the form z to the m, where m is proportional to the direction of this rho. Okay, so more precisely, this thing we really need <coughs> an element in. And let me add this variable. Okay, so I introduce a variable h bar, such that here I wrote q equal exponential times h bar. Why is it that you have an i, I don't have an i? It's just a matter of, of uh, convention. Oh. Like it is. <laughs> like it is like a. Like it's like if you do like openness quantum mechanics, if you want h bar to be a real element. Like yeah, it does not. To just correspond to like inserting signs somewhere. Okay, and so in practice, we'll take R to be the ring of formal power series in some variable T1, Tn, where you have essentially one variable for, again, for each of the vector m, for each of the singularities that I So this thing is really a kind of generating series, which has exactly the right form to be a generating series of, of, of these numbers. When this parameter pi, we essentially remember this pi, is essentially the homogeneous class of the curve. And this power of z will be essentially the, the class of the, of the boundary cycle on the torus, which is shrink at infinity. Or equivalently, is the precise turn the condition at infinity. Okay, but this thing is just abstract definition. I have a collection of rays, and each ray is, is equal to this kind of generating series. And now you say that such a scattering diagram <coughs> is consistent. If, especially for any plus gamma, <coughs> in R2, so this picture is drawn in R2, and so for any path gamma which intersect 
you assume that it intersects transversely all the rays and does not go into intersection points of the rays. If you take the product over the intersection point of gamma with the rays, so maybe here I have some intersection point. So it's really a path, so it's really gamma, let's say, from z1 to z2. And as on my picture, it's really a closed path. So it's like gamma 0 goes gamma 1. And so at some time in 0, 1, so at some time, let's say, yeah, like gamma, let's say I have a t row, some intersection point with the ray rho. And so associated to C the ray, there is this corresponding generating function, like this kind of value in the quantum torus object. And so I look to the automorphism of the quantum torus given by conjugation by the exponential of this element. And I do that to the power on psi, which is psi of determinant of the direction of the ray rho, with essentially the direction of the path. So the derivative gamma x times k rho. Okay, so, so this object is, I start somewhere in my path, each time I cross the ray, there is a corresponding generating series, and formally, I take exponential of each generating series. And so this thing is some element in quantum torus turns out the ring of coefficients. And so I can look to its action on the quantum torus given by conjugation by this element. Okay, so this thing is a product of automorphism of the quantum torus. And you see that this scattering diagram is consistent, this thing automorphism is identity. Okay, so maybe in the most familiar story in dimension two of scattering diagram from your symmetry, what you can't say is like especially <coughs> Poisson automorphisms of the usual tori. And this story is a kind of classical limit of this story. Okay, so there is some elementary fact. Which is quite like a concept of summer. Say that if you start with any scattering diagram in R2, there is essentially a unique minimal way to complete it. So to add some rays, we could do some function, such that it becomes consistent. Any scattering diagram. in a consistent way. And it's really some easy argument, which goes like order by order, it's part of t, that if here I have two rays crossing, and if I look to the loop around, if the corresponding product of automorphism is not the identity, you look to the leading order of term of this automorphism, and, and you see that you can kill it if you introduce the correct ray. And then you iterate the process. So this picture can looks complicated, but like everything is happening on this kind of ring of power series, and I got finite order in the variable Ti, everything is finite. So everything makes sense. Okay, so now I need to explain what is a scattering diagram which is relevant to our picture, our geometrical situation. So so I consider a scattering diagram where I have, uh, where essentially the initial ray has a kind of ray which were already in this board, which are the rays defining the toric surface. So essentially for each mi, I add the ray, let's say rho j, rho j, rho j, and the ray the 
And you should really think of this initial ray as being the initial polymorphic curves produced by the singularities. So, so the R2 in which you draw things is like the moment space? It's like the, in some limit, it's the base of the XYZ vibration. It's a dual. Yes, yes. So, 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 so it's not the moment map, but it's the it's dual. dual. Yes. Yeah. And if you find from the toric perspective, I say it's really where I draw the fan. So, so it's a dual. But also the base of S. Sorry? But yes, so the base of S. So, so like a fiber over a point of this thing is this torus where you jump where you left at the first end? Yes, or in some limit where this point goes to infinity in some particular direction. Okay, so I need to tell you what is the function that attach the initial rays. And I attach the following function. explicit expression. And what this thing is, is a contribution of multi-covers. So, you know, when you have a very simple singularity, really what it's produced is really some simple disk like that. And so this completely looking expression is a contribution of essentially multi-cover and contracted component space contribution of this disk. Okay, so yes, it's initially, so this thing is really a kind of more precise version of the picture of these bodies coming to begin with, and interacting. And so I can call D this scattering, scattering diagram. And then we call SD the consistent, so the associated scattering diagram, which is produced purely algebraically, starting with this initial data and this algebraic lemma. And now the main theorem is that in this completed Basically, we'll produce new mini rays. And if I look to some ray, so here, which has primitive direction, direction M, and if I look to the set PM of all P, so this P, P1 to PN. So that is sum over p, j, m, j is some multiple of m. So this thing is simply a set essentially of, of homology classes, which will produce new disk with boundary, with class of boundary, some multiple of this direction of m. So we have a set of possible such classes. And so the main theorem is that the function hm attached to this ray is equal to some optimization factor. It's essentially the generating series of these iogenous environments that they have defined previously. So this side is defined geometrically, it's counting these iogenous curves, and this side is defined purely algebraically in terms of this kind of initial data.
So in other ways, it was the kind of geometric scattering of four matrix curves of possibly hydrogen coming together is correctly described as this algebraic scattering formulated in terms of the quantum torus, which I pray is not clear that one has something to do with, with the other. So I should say that the kind of more classical story, the kind of general zero story, which is a kind of classical semi-limiter statement, is a, is a work for tropical vertex work of gross point for the theory. But you think it which will appear in the usual mirror symmetry. And this thing is some kind of update of the to the higher genus quantum torus deformation story. And so 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 you know so you can read this statement in many various ways, but for example it's tells you that you can compute these numbers simply purely algebraically, simply by solving this algebraic problem. So you can see system methods like computing these numbers. In fact, I've also forgotten the original question here. Can you explain the meaning of this theorem in terms of taking this twice and moving it around? So I think it's easier so if you have a torus that you move around, yeah. and if you care about whatever the mass of index 2 curves. So here, what I was considering is actually the mass of index 0 story. But you will have the kind of mass of index two story, which will, which when somehow you cross a torus bounding a mass of index zero, this would jump. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of classical general zero story tells you that you have this wall crossing story of count of mass of index two disk in terms of mass of index zero disk. Mm -hmm. And the kind of usual consistency of scattering diagram tells you that if you move this torus around, and if you go back, you have a, I mean, there are various ways. It's slightly confusing because there are various ways to take this picture. If you can, let's say, forget this direct picture, but you do kind of mirror symmetry story. So this count will, because of the count of mass of index zero <coughs> curves, this count of mass of two disk would jump. There would be some more crossing phenomena. But if you construct your mirror in a way by taking a green function and actually taking into account this mass of index zero disk, then ultimately your Count of mass of index two. This will define a well-defined function on the mirror. It's like one way to explain the story, or you get super potential for mirror. So, so. Wait, so it just point is, we all the way around to come back to each other. Yeah. Like yeah. Exactly. And, and so, so, so your theorem is saying, what is the wall crossing formula that should be for the hydrogen? Yes. Yeah. Or what? I guess. But in some way, virtually good in Rafa, there's something really close in the physical term when you have a torus, and each time you cross, it's like chance of is modified in some way. And then when you cross, and there is nothing in the middle, the effect of that should somehow should be trivial. And so the statement is that, I mean, in some ways, this statement is exactly <coughs> what you expect, because the expectation, I guess that's in your term, the way you deform chance of is by inserting the kind of all on the middle of the loop, and so this thing is exactly this insertion. And if you are doing you want to transform of service, the insertion is really the operator living in the quantum torus algebra. And this conjugation is really the kind of action of the operator of the theory of this insertion. And so the claim is that when you go around, you think it's supposed to be trivial if it's not single symmetry of possible. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, so you can uh, it's on the statement, the argument address that can be predicted directly from the kind of transform. <laughs> But it's a kind of higher generation of the most classical general zero story. And so I would just say, because I want to finish by something slightly different, so I'll just be very quick on two. The key thing that first you start as it grows from the zero situation, essentially you push your singularity, singular fibers at infinity. So algebraically, what really happens is some kind of degenerations. But you, know, you push your singularity at infinity. And so what really remains is some the original like toric geometry, because it is no, no longer singularity. And so here you will have some some hydrogenous curve in a toric geometry with various contact points with the toric boundaries. 
if you use the kind of diffusion arguments, we use equations to see if kind of higher general Gamma-Fourier invariants define in a kind of toric geometry way. And then you prove some kind of protocol correspondence theory. Essentially, the claim is that the iogenous invariance of toric surface is can be computed at the tropical level in terms of the, of the whatever, whatever block, culture, shender, refined tropical kind. So I have no time to explain what it is, but it's uh, like in a purely tropical setting, there is a story where there is some variable q when saying that like q to the one of minus two to the minus one. Okay, and so the main issue is how to prove that this kind of combinatorially defined objects correspond to this kind of biogenous curves. And in the most traditional correspondence theorem, that's in Kalkin or Nishin Zibert, between complex geometry and tropical geometry, most of the time there are like finitely many curves here, finitely many curves here, and you already map one to the other, and, and you get the result. So here what's going on, yeah, there is really a non-trivial module space. So remember our module space that we had for the G, so yeah, there is really no non-trivial module space. And so the claim is that some of, certainly this correspondence is not some one-to-one -one enumerative correspondence, you need some of the virtual story to, to go as well. And, um, and, and so it used part of the Law of the technology, you can have a rubber chain with sensitivity, but essentially you kind of degenerate further this, this picture. This tropical curve should really be a picture of kind of generic degeneration of your curve, of appropriate degeneration. And so somehow re you reduce to some kind of simpler toric geometry where you essentially have only three divisor, and you still need to count like higher curve like that, which is so some of these things should somehow be the contribution of one vertex of the tropical curve. So this thing is still a non-trivial computation to do, I and mean, it's still some higher dimensional memory spaces. And, but essentially you use various tricks to reduce the situation to essentially the situation of a line in P2. And what is special for a line in P2 is that there is no multiple <coughs> cover, there is only contracted components. And then you can use some, um, and it's essentially very reduced to Gromov-Witten theory of P1, which is now it's essentially the same computation as motion at the end, as it's taught by Vivek. So it's a result of Brian and Rekonde. Which, at the end of the day, is a kind of explicit computation in a very simple situation where you have something with generating series of iogenous numbers, and by some miracle, it happens to be some rational function of this variable Q. Sorry, how do you get to this rational curve in P2? Can you give us a step, or would you say? Yeah, so I did not explain this step. <laughs> so, 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 after you might imagine to reduce to this kind of situation. Yeah. But in general, see, even this kind of situation is not so simple because this is a linear system of curves. Mm -hmm. can contain curves which are, for example, not necessarily of genus zero. Mm -hmm. so, so, you cannot easily reduce this thing to a, to a kind of genus zero story. But, yeah, so, so you need to use some, <coughs> so, some tricks. So essentially, this thing is a kind of contribution of a vertex. Okay. And I think you don't know what it is. But from what you proved previously, you prove that you can use this elementary vertex as a building block for more complicated problems. Mm -hmm. Another trick is to take the complicated problem and to degenerate in a, tropically in different ways. Okay. And you the fact that the answer has to be the same. Mm -hmm. And so you can deduce non trivial relation between these vertices for like different numerical values of the vertices. Mm -hmm. And the claim is that when you have enough so you can do some induction, and the initial step of the induction is this very simple case. And in this very simple case, it happens that everything is contract component and computed. So, so here are some, let's say some corollary from 
But it's primarily from your result proved by quantity to some amount about these scattering diagrams. So about these numbers, you can get some integrality. So you can essentially check for these numbers that expected over eva for GPS integrality for kind of open curves. So there exists. Of Laurent point of view, with integral coefficient, such that the generating series I mean, there is a unit of the unit of the unit of These are previously during series of Russian numbers, but it tells you that somehow it's captured by finitely many integers. That is kind of universal formula. And, and actually, geometrically, it's not obvious how to prove it, but once you know this correspondence, that you know that the numbers are defined as this scattering diagram, now it's a kind of purely algebraic property of the scattering diagrams, which is, in fact, it's not easy, but it's proved by completely somehow. And I will end by some story involving. Um, yeah, so maybe, yeah, so, so, so the obvious, obvious corollary is the kind of thing that I announced at the beginning, which is that you can do some quant deformation quantization story. So, so in fact, for how exactly the surface of considered growth I can kill. As even the algebraic realization of the expected mirror symmetry story. And so you get some mirror, which in general is some affine surface. You get over some, in general it's over some formal of the symmetry as expected. And so it's really affine, it's really has some ring of functions. This thing is really chromatic symplectic, it's a ring of function. At some Poisson bracket, it would really make sense to ask, produce a deformation <coughs> quantization of it, to want conductive deformation of it. And so the statement is that using this story, you can use so it's that usual gross second key construction take as input to a zero curve, you produce a mirror. So here you use these iogenous curves. And so what you produce is deformation quantization. <coughs> And you can say more, like in the case where the surface is affine, so there is a kind of positive condition of the boundaries, and in this case, this formal thing in fact is <coughs> algebraic. And in fact, this mirror you want to check is roughly from whatever rank two, whatever cluster X variety. And so in this case, the deformation quantization is some kind of something which is known, which is a quantum cluster X variety. But as a consequence of this story, using the fact that since this mirror symmetry story, there is some theta function story and canonical basis story, the upshot is that you are able to produce canonical basis, so you get canonical basis. Or whatever wrong to it's a very some purely algebraic question which has nothing to do with IOG screws, but it's not some of consequences of this. <coughs> and I would like to end with some comments <coughs> about <laughs> which again, apparently has nothing to do with So I claim that exactly in the context of Define, where I started with this collection of vectors M and which you can everything, there is a way to construct a quiver, which are simply N vertices. So essentially, there is <coughs> one vertex for each single fiber of the x y vibration. And from the vertex i to the vertex j, we put the number of arrows which is determinant of the 
Okay, now so you take the terminal for the less than max. Okay, so this thing gives you a very simple re so uh, sorry. So yes, this collection of vectors in the square and the complete determinants give you a number, this thing has a number of arrows in the quiver. So you have a well different quiver. And now assume that this quiver is a cyclic. So without closed cycle, in fact, you can easily check that it's like assuming that the initial rays, the scattering, are all inside one half plane. Okay, so you see that. And then you can check that there is some, if you look to stable conditions of this quiver, because it's acyclic, there is always a kind of trivial stability. Well, essentially, the only stable are the kind of the kind of one-dimensional vector space given at one vertex and zero everywhere. So it's a kind of trivial stuff. And there is always a kind of maximally non-trivial stability. So it's again because it's acyclic, you can introduce the arrows to find the natural partial ordering on your stuff, and so there is one stability where all the stability parameters are completely compatible with this partial ordering or completely anti-compatible with this partial ordering. And so for this maximally natural stability for every P, so it's the same thing as before, this collection of integers, so before it was the thing defined me by homology class, now it's defined me some dimension vector for a quiver representation, so integer for each vertex. And so I can consider some module space Body space of representation of my quiver for the maximum non trivial stability of charge P. And I can introduce the kind of sorry, DT invariant, which, which essentially is a pretty numbers, collection of pretty numbers of these modi spaces, except that these modi spaces in general are singular, so you take intersection cohomology of that. Okay, so this thing, the polynomial in Q coefficient are simply pretty numbers for intersection cohomology of moduli spaces of quivers. And so, the last result, yeah, again, if QM is a cyclic, then this DT invariant, this is thing is equal to the underlying BPS invariant of this count of hydrogen. And the reason is because it's part of a general DT theory that is that the change in stability conditions is described by essentially the formalism of automorphism with value in the quantum torus. And so this scattering diagram, which in our picture we're describing scattering of hydrogenous curves, in fact, is exactly the same formalism which describes how socially detailed value changes when you change the stability. And so, yeah. And maybe I just make this final remark, like you know, as just basic elementary fact for why these two very different looking objects are related, is that if you look to the so-called quantum logarithm function, You know, if you do DT theory, the main issue is to count semi-stable objects, because semi-stable objects have a natural group of automorphism, typically something like GLN. And so you need to consider a thing like the stack of one over GLN, and this thing is essentially one over the, whatever, the virtual Poincaré polynomial of GLN. 
So this thing is a thing which is very natural from the point of view of TT theory. But the complete elementary fungus interesting function is the same thing as this function. Well, this thing is like, it's exactly the expected multi cover for iogenous open current in Calabria 3 okay, So simply, so you can give it. Just understand why this thing is true, and you can see if there is strange relation between this. Yes, it's iogenous open curve where Q is related to the <coughs> genus parameter. Uh, on the other side, you have the TT theory, and Q is some essentially some cohomological parameter. Okay, so, so it's a very strange. So this kind of relation is very, it's like geometrically very strange. That is the consequence of the proof to the end. I stopped it. Time for one quick question. Then. Okay. Right. So, uh, the question about different DC. Yeah. So, if you might ask, you know, the DC count on that same surface. Long ago, it was a conjecture, but it's low by a variance. Yes. So, so yeah, which is a, a different statement. Is that that natural to this? Can you prove that in the country? No. I see. Maybe because it's a kind of. I mean, somehow. It's a short answer. And somehow it's an orthogonal awesome direction to the thing I, I'm really trying to so what would happen if you just apply MNLP correspondence? Yeah, very good. So applying MNLP. Yeah. So like it's like assume there is like log dt. Like so I assume there is log dt, and there is log MNLP. Yeah. And so you get that this thing will be some probably some rational function in Q, which right, which is good because it is. And and and, and, and you know so the coefficient of the power of the Q expression will be like what, stable pairs and variance. Or <laughs> logs, different pairs, or log yeah. and but it will be a different statement, right? I mean, so, so you know, so we'll get this statement, but it will be a different statement because you know, for example, each powers of Q, the coefficient is some kind of whatever, characteristic of some modulus space. Mm -hmm. In particular, in MNLP, the variable Q is not some cohomological parameter; it's the holomorphic order characteristic of the sheaf. Yeah, well, what if you also assume this Dalai statement of the, the, this Andre, uh, no, this, this um, Nekrasov of Kunkov? So, 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 yes, so, exactly. So, so, so we get some other statement. Yeah. And again, the relation between C statement and C statement probably should be seen as an example of the type of relation predicted by Nekrasov of Kunkov okay. statements. Well, you have exactly this kind of. Very different looking variables, but which at the end of the day have a big change and are related. Well, let's uh, continue for this afternoon. Great. We'll take a break now. Thank you, Gary, again.